Hello, AP Human Geography students. This is Unit 2, Population and Migrations. Mr. Gallegos, take some Cornell notes while you listen to this lecture. So I've got some terms for you, like the demographic transition model, which is a model that shows a society's changes in population over time. So this model shows you time on the x-axis and growth on the uh, y-axis, and it shows you how a country goes from stage 1 all the way to stage 4. Now it's important that you draw this out for yourself so that you can understand the changes and variations both in the death rate and the birth rate and how that contributes to a growth in total population over time. Dependency ratio, that's the number of people that depend on other younger working people that are, that are actively in the workforce. So th when you think of dependence, think of people like these babies and these elderly folks that depend on the workforce. Doubling time, that's the length of time it takes for a population to double. So for example, here you have the growth of human population over time, and as you can tell, the doubling time got really short in these last few um, decades of the 20th century. Ecumen or ecumeni are the geographic regions of the earth that are occupied by people, or the areas of the earth that we can actually settle on. So as you can tell from this map, not every area on Earth is inhabited by people, but the areas that are, are called the ecumen. Arithmetic population density. That's the entire population of a country divided by the total land area. So in class, we've studied this term as the amount of people divided by square unit of land. So for example, here on this map, you have the areas that are darkest. Those are the areas with the highest arithmetic population density. And the areas with the uh, lightest pink, the 0 to 25 areas, are the areas with the uh, lowest arithmetic population density. Physiological population density is a little different because it measures the amount of people per unit of arable land. Arable land is also known as farmland, like this one in the image. Agricultural population density, that's the number of farmers per unit of arable or usable land. So whereas physiological was just number of people. This one has to do with farmers specifically. Epidemiologic transition. This one is similar to the demographic transition model, but in this one you get to know why a population grows, and that's basically because of improvements in medicine. So things like vaccinations, for example, have made people's lives longer. They've also guaranteed that all the babies that are born are actually going to survive. Overpopulation. When the population of a region or a place reaches a limit, it means that it's overpopulated just only when resources available are not uh, enough for all the population. So for example, Thomas Malthus predicted that as the production of food was linear and our growth of population was exponential, over time we were going to eventually reach a Malthusian catastrophe. That's a point in time where we ran out of food. Population pyramid. This is a bar graph basically that shows the distribution of population by gender, sex, and age. So for example, here's India in, 20, in 2001, and you have your males and your females, and as you can tell, it's a very wide base on this pyramid, so that means it's a rapidly growing population. Sex ratio. That's the amount of men per 100 women in a population. So for example, here is the sex ratio at birth in 2012, and as you can tell, the highest numbers are here in China and India and parts of South and East Asia, and the lowest are out here in North and South America. Actually, Australia is also one of the lowest ones here, and Russia as well. Zero population growth. When the number of births equals the number of deaths in a country or a state or a region. So for example, here on this uh, map, we have uh, China and India again, with the uh, highest change in population, highest growth in population. And then we have regions here, for example, in South America, where there is literally zero population growth. Chain migration. That's migration to an area where a family member is or a friend already lives there. Our friend has also migrated there. So, for example, we have these children here that likely came over with a family member or a friend who had already migrated here before. Internal migration. That's also known as interregional migration, and it's migration within a country or a state, so inside of a country or a state. So, for example, this is the, the map of the first great migration. That's when African Americans left the South and they moved north to major cities like Detroit, Chicago, 
uh, New York. And then you have the second Great Migration here, uh, the second phase of this interregional migration, where those same cities uh, started to grow, but also the West started to see some growth. Uh, cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, uh, Portland, Oregon. Push and pull factors. These are factors or reasons that encourage or force people to migrate. So generally, push factors are negative. They make people leave. They push them out. So things like wars, things like famines. Uh, and then pull factors are usually positive. These are things that usually attract people to move. Things like job opportunities and better economies and freedom. Refugees. These are people who flee their country due to political, social, or religious persecutions. So you might think of refugees as people who have to leave their country for some kind of uh, very, va very valid push factor. So for example, these refugees here um, are likely leaving their nations of origin because there might have been some kind of push factor making them leave. Voluntary migration. This is the kind of the opposite because it's based on choice. So voluntary migration, for example, occurs at the United States-Mexico border almost on a daily basis. So as you can tell, these agents here are doing a routine check on this car, which is uh, uh, occupied by a couple of voluntary migrants. 